Fireside Tales with Wolfgang, episode 14. Originally broadcast on GWC Productions' YouTube channel, CAPS Media Television Channel 6, KPPQLP Ventura at 104.1 FM, and on the KPPQ Podcast Network. Greetings and salutations. I'm Hunter Ackerman, here to read some classic literature for you and my beastly feline companion, Wolfgang. So, Wolfus, what do you want to hear? This is, in all honesty, this, this is my favorite. This is my favorite poem by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Paul Lawrence Dunbar was famous for writing in dialect as well as natural dialogue and formal English verse. That's, that's just incredibly profound that he was such a writer in these three completely different styles. Now, what I didn't know until just today is that Paul Lawrence Dunbar was classmates with Orville Wright of the Wright brothers. And this was significant because the Wright brothers um, had a newspaper in Dayton, Ohio. They started the first African-American newspaper, which Dunbar wrote for and edited at the age of 16. So, I mean, talk about progressives. These guys were the first in flight and used their money to form a, to found a, a black newspaper. I, I just, I, I was blown away by that. Uh, Dunbar li- lacked the funds to attend law school, so he worked as an elevator operator before dedicating himself purely to writing. And um, Dunbar was also very influential to Gwendolyn Brooks, who became the first African American to receive the Pulitzer and the first black U.S. poet laureate. Um, <clears throat> this is this is great. This thing, uh, this is going to be. This is one of his dialect poems, and this is written with such a rhythm. I immediately heard a melody and chord progression to it. I. Seen my lady home last night. Jump back, honey, jump back. Held her hand and squeezed it tight. Jump back, honey, jump back. Heard her sigh, a little sigh. See a little gleam for her eye and say a smile. Flit go by. Jump back, honey, jump back. Heard the wind blow through the pine. Jump back, honey, jump back. Mockingbird won't sing in fine. Jump back, honey, jump back. And my heart was beating so when I reached my lady's door that I could not bear to go. Jump back, honey, jump back. Put my arm around her waist. Jump back, honey, jump back. Raised her lips and took a taste. Jump back, honey, jump back. Love me, honey, love me true. Love me well as I love you. And she answered, course I do. Jump back, honey, jump back. I got... <laughs> um, I blew up a few of the, of the lines just so for camera you could see how this is printed. I mean, you, you gotta see... Um, Hell, her hand and squeeze it tight. That's literally how it's written. And, uh, <laughs> heard the wind blow through the pine. <laughs> that I couldn't bear to go. And, I mean, like, just, it's, it's not even put my arm around her waist. It's put my arm around her waist. I, right? That's, it's, this, this took me more like goings over and over than Shakespearean text does. Uh, it's, it's, it is just so perfectly inhabiting its place and time. I really, I mean, it's public domain, so I'm thinking 
I've got to do something with washboard, a kick drum, and a country blues harp. And uh, that's, that's probably going to be a song of the week on Hunter's Acoustic Cabin. Because that was just so... Oh, man. Um, yeah. Por uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Right, Cell, uh, I wouldn't have been able to make sense of it. Okay, so um, I, I said a couple of weeks back, I probably said more than once, uh, my mom is a retired literature teacher. And um, back in the, in the 70s, was it, Mom? She taught at um, an, uh, an all-black, or, or at least mostly black, school in, in the town where I was born and raised. And, um, uh, yeah, mom's got this entire, uh, crazy background in African American literature. And, uh, and so, yeah, that one, that one, um, uh, I, my, my love for Paul Lawrence Dunbar, uh, is fed directly from mom. <clears throat> Poem by Percy Shelley who was born in 1792 and passed away in a very untimely manner in 1822. This is Love's Philosophy by Percy Shelley. The fountains mingle with the river and the rivers with the ocean. The winds of heaven mix forever with a sweet emotion. Nothing in the world is single. All things by a law divine in one spirit meet and mingle. Why not I with thine? See the mountains kiss high heaven and the waves clasp one another. No sister flower would be forgiven if it disdained its brother and the sunlight clasps the earth and the moonbeams kiss the sea. What is all this sweet worth if thou kiss not me? Published in 1912. It reads to me like something that was published in the 1930s. It feels like Steinbeck. It feels like uh, serious Dust Bowl, Great Depression kind of stuff. <clears throat> but... This was written by uh, Susan Glassbell. Uh, Susan was born in 1876 and died in 1948. She won the Pulitzer for drama in 1931. And uh, let me refill my tea. We will move on. I think, I think this, uh, this story predates the anarchist symbol that we all saw in heavy metal albums so prevalent in the 80s. <clears throat> this is called The Anarchist his Dog by Susan Glassbell, 1912. Stubby had a root, paper root. That was how he happened to get a dog. And for the benefit of those who never carried papers, it should be thrown in that having a route means getting up just when there really is some fun in sleeping, then lining up at the leader office, maybe having a scrap with the fellow who says you took his line, getting your papers, which are all damp from the presses, starting for the outskirts of the city, and then, then you double up the paper in a way that'll cause all possible difficulty in undoubling it and hurl it with what force you have against the front door. It's also good to have a route, for you at least earn your salt, 
So your father says. And so your father can't blame you for that stuff no more. If he does, you know it isn't so. When you have a route, you whistle. All the fellas whistle. They may not feel like it, but it's the custom. As could be sworn to by many sleepy citizens. And as time goes on, you succeed in acquiring the easy manner of a brigand. Now, Stubby... Stubby was little. And everything about him seemed... sawed off just a second too soon. His nose, his fingers, and most of all, his hair. His head was a faithful replica of a chestnut burr. His hair did not lie down and take things easy. It stood up and out. So Stubby bristled. That is, he appeared to bristle. Inwardly, Stubby yearned, though he would have swung into his very best brigand manner on the spot if you were to suggest so offensive a thing. Just to look at Stubby, you'd never guess in a thousand years what a funny feeling he sometimes had when he got to the top of the hill where his route began, and he could see a long way down the river, and the town curled in on the other side. Sometimes when the morning sun was shining through a mist, making things awful strange, some of the mist got into Stubby's squinty little eyes. After the mist behaved that way, he always whistled so rakishly and threw his papers with such abandonment that people turned over in their beds and muttered things about having that little heathen of a paper boy shot. All along the route were dogs. Indeed, routes are distinguished by their dogs. Mean routes are those that have terraces and mean dogs. Good routes are where the houses are close together and the dogs run out and wag their tails. Though, Stubby's greater difficulty came through the wagon tails. He carried in a collie neighborhood. All the collies seemed consumed with mighty ambitions to have their own routes. If you spoke to them, and how could you help speaking to a collie when he came bounding out to you that way? You had an awful time chasing him back, and when he got lost, and it seemed collies spent most of their time getting lost, the woman would put her head out the next morning and want to know if you had coaxed her dog away. Some of the fellas had dogs that went with them on their routes. One day, one of them asked Stubby, why he didn't have a dog. And he, rep he replied in a surly fashion that he didn't have one because he didn't want one. If he wanted one, he guessed he'd have one. And there was no one within earshot old enough or wise enough or tender enough to know from the meanness of Stubby's tone and by his evil scowl that his heart was just breaking to own a dog. One day, a new dog appeared along the route. He was yellow and looked like a cheap edition of a bulldog. He was that kind of dog most accurately described by saying it's hard to describe him. The kind you say is just a dog and everybody knows. He tried to follow Stubby, not in the trusting, bounding manner of the collies. No, 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 not happily, but hopingly. Stubby, true to the ethics of the profession, chased him back where he was come from. And now just so there might be nothing whatsoever on his conscience, he even threw a stone after him. Stubby was an expert in throwing things at dogs. He could seem to just miss them and yet never hit them. Next day, the next day it happened again. But just as he had a clod poised for throwing, a window went up and a woman called out, For pity's sake, little boy, don't chase him back here. Well, well why? Uh, ain't he yours? Called Stubby. 
Mercy, no. We can't chase him away. Well, whose is he? Demanded Stubby. Why, he's nobody's. He just hangs around. I wish you'd coax him away. Well, that was a new one. And then, all in a heap, it rushed over Stubby that this dog, who was nobody's dog, could, if he coaxed him away, and that woman wanted him coaxed away, could be his dog. And because that idea had such a strange effect on him, he sang out in offhand fashion, Oh, all right. I'll take him away, and I'll drown him for you. Go, oh, little boy, called the woman. Don't, don't, don't drown him. All right, all right. I'll shoot him then, called obliging Stubby, whistling for the dog. While well, all morning long, the woman grieved over having sent a helpless little dog away with that perfectly brutal little paper boy. Stubby's mother was washing. She looked up from her tubs on the back porch to say, Wish you'd take that bucket. Then, seeing what was slinking behind her son, straight away assumed the role of destiny with, Get on out of here! Stubby snapped his fingers behind his back as much as to say, Wait a minute. A woman, a woman gave him to me, he said to his mother. Gave him to you, she scoffed. I should think she would. Then, something happened that had not happened many times in Stubby's short lifetime. He acknowledged his feelings. I'd like to keep him. I'd like to have a dog. His mother shook her hands and the flying sud seemed to express her scorn. Ha! That ugly good-for-nothing thing! The dog had edged in between Stubby's feet and crouched there. He could go with me on my route, said Stubby. He'd kind of be company for me. And when he had said that, he knew all at once just how lonesome he had been sometimes on his route. How he wanted something to be a kind of company for him. His face twitched and he stooped down to pat the dog. Mrs. Lynch looked at her son, youngest of her five. It was not the hardness of her heart, but the hardness of her life that made her unpracticed in moments of tenderness. Something in the way Stubby was patting the dog suggested to her that Stubby was a strange one. He was kind of little to be carrying papers all by himself anyway. Stubby looked up. He could eat what's thrown away. Our table scraps. That was an error in diplomacy. The woman's face hardened. Mighty little be thrown away this winter, she muttered. But just then, Mrs. Johnson appeared on the other side of the fence, began hanging up her clothes. And with that, Mrs. Lynch saw her way to justify herself in indulging her son. You see, Mrs. Johnson and Mrs. Lynch had had words. You just let him stay around, Stubby, she called. And you would have supposed from her tone it was Stubby who was on the other side of the fence. Maybe he'll keep the neighbor's chickens out. Them that ain't got chickens of their own don't want to be bothered with the neighbors. That was how it happened that he stayed. And no one but Stubby knew. And possibly... Stubby didn't either. How it happened? That his dog got to be named Hero. Now, it would seem the Hero should be a noble St. Bernard or a particular mean-looking bulldog, not a stocky, shapeless, squint-eyed yellow dog with one ear bitten off and 
one leg built on an entirely different plan than its other fella legs. Possibly, Stubby's own spiritual experiences had suggested to him that you were not necessarily the way you looked. The chickens were pretty well kept out, though no one ever saw Hero doing any of it. Perhaps Hero had been too long associated with Chasen to desire any part in it, even with the roles reversed. If Stubby could help it, no one really saw Stubby doing the chasing either. He became skilled in chasing when he did not appear to be chasing them chickens. Then he would get Hero to barking and turn to his mother with, Guess you don't see so many chickens around nowadays. The fellas in the line jeered at Hero at first, but they soon tired of it when the stubby said he didn't want the cur, but his mother made him stay around to keep the chickens out. He was a fine chicken dog, Stubby grudgingly admitted. Stubby said he couldn't keep the dog from following, so he just let him come. Sometimes when they were waiting in line, Stubby made ferocious threats at Hero. He was gonna break his back and wring his head off and do other heartless things, which for some reason he never started in on right then and there to accomplish. He was different when they were alone. And they were alone a good deal. Stubby's route wasn't nearly so long after he had Hero to go with him. When winter came and five o'clock was dark and cold for starting out, it was pretty good to have Hero trotting along at his heels. And Hero always wanted to go. It was never so rainy nor so cold that that yellow dog seemed to think he would rather stay home by the fire, not once. Then Hero was always waiting for him when he would come home from school. Stubby would sing out, Hello, Kerr! And the tone was such that Hero did not grasp that he was being insulted. Sometimes, when there was nobody about, Stubby picked Hero up in his arms and squeezed him. Stubby had not had a large experience with squeezing. At those times, Hero would lick Stubby's face and whimper, a little love whimper. And <laughs> such were the workings of Stubby's heart and mind. <sighs> it was as if Hero really had chased the chickens. Stubby, who had seen the way dogs can look at you, was never one to say, what good is he? But it seemed there were such people. There were even people who thought you oughtn't have a dog to love and to love you if you weren't one of them rich people who could pay two dollars and a half per year for the luxury of having a dog. Stubby first heard of them people one night in June. The father of the Lynch family was sitting in the backyard reading the paper when Hero and Stubby came running in from the alley. It was one of those moments, one of those times when Hero, forgetting the bleakness of, of his youth, abandoned himself to the joy of living. He was running round and round Stubby, just barking. When Stubby's father called out, Hey, shut up there, you cur. You better lie low. You won't be shot the first of August. Stubby came to a halt because regarding the joy of living, Hero had done as much for Stubby as Stubby had for Hero. The fun and frolic just died right out of him and he stood there staring at his father who had turned the page and was setting himself up to a new horror. At last Stubby spoke. Uh... 
Why is he going to be shot in the first day of August? He asked in a tight little voice. His father looked up. Why is he going to be shot? You got any two dollars and a half to pay for him? He laughed as though that were a joke. Well, it was something of a joke. Stubby, Stubby got ten cents a week out of his paper money. The rest he turned in for his family. Then, his father went back to his paper. There was another long pause before Stubby asked in that tight little voice, What do I have to pay two dollars and a half for? Nobody else owns him. His parent stirred scornfully. Perhaps you never heard of a dog tax, did you? Suppose they don't learn you nothing like that at school? Yeah, Stubby did know the dogs had to have tags and such around their necks on a collar like, but he hadn't thought anything about that in connection with Hero. So we ventured another question. You have to have them for all dogs? Even if you just pick them up on the street and took care of them and nobody else would? You bet you do, his parent assured him genially. You pay your dog tax or the policeman comes on the 1st of August and shoots your dog. With that, he dismissed it for good, burying himself in his paper. For a minute, the boy stood there in silence. Then he walked slowly around the house and sat down where his father couldn't see him. Hero followed. It was the way Hero had. The dog sat down beside the boy, and after a couple minutes, the boy's arm stole furtively around him, and they sat there. Still. For a very long time. As nobody but Hero paid much attention to him. Nobody save Hero noticed how quiet Stubby was for the next three days. Hero must have noticed, for he was quiet too. He followed wherever Stubby would let him. Every time he got a chance, Hero would nestle up to him and look into his face. That way even cur dogs have a doing when they fear something is wrong. At the end of three days, Stubby, his little freckled face set and grim, took his stand in front of his father and came right out with it. I want to keep one week's paper money to pay Hero's dog tax. His father's chair had been tilted back against a tree. Now it came down with a thud. Oh, you do, do you? I can earn the other 50 cents at little jobs. Oh, you can, can you? Now, ain't you smart? The tone brought the blood to Stubby's face. I think I got a right to. The man's face, which had been taunting, grew ugly. Look at here, young man, none of your lip. The tears rushed to Stubby's eyes, but he stumbled on. I, I guess Hero's got a right to some of my paper money when he, he goes with me every day on my route. At that, his father stared for a minute, then bust into a loud laugh. Blinded with tears, the boy turned to the house. <sighs> After she had gone to bed that night, Stubby's mother heard a sound from the alcove at the head of the stairs where her youngest child slept. And the sound kept on. She got out of her bed and went to Stubby's little cot. Look here, she said awkwardly, but not unkindly. This, this won't do. We're poor folks, Freddy. It was only once in a while that she called him 
fretty and not stubby. It's all we can do to live in these times. We, we can't pay no dog tax. Miss Stubby did not speak. She added, I know you take into the dog, but just the same, you ain't to feel hard to your pa. He can't help it, neither can I. Things is as they is, and ain't nobody can help it. Stubby was still gulping back sobs. So she added what she thought was a master stroke in consolation. Now, you just go right to sleep. And if they come to take this dog away, maybe you can pick up another one in the fall. The sobs suddenly stopped and Stubby just stared at her. And what he said after a long stare was... I guess there ain't no use in you and me talking about it. That's right, said she, relieved. Now, you go right off to sleep. And then she left him, never dreaming why Stubby had seen there was no use talking about it. Nor did he talk about it. But a change came over Stubby's funny little person in the next few days. The change was particularly concerned with his jaw. Though there was something different, too, in the lights in his eyes as he looked straight ahead, and something different in his voice when he said, Come on, hero. He got so he could walk into a store and demand in a hard little voice, You want a boy, little boy, do anything for you? And when they said, Got more boys and we know what to do with, Sonny, Stubby would say, Well, all right then, and stalk sturdily out again. Vacation came next week, and still, he had found nothing. His father, however, had been more successful. He found a place where they wanted a boy to work in a yard for a couple of hours in the morning. For that, Stubby was to get a dollar and a half per week. But, of course, that was to be turned into the family for his keep. There were lots of mouths to feed. Stubby's mother was always saying to her neighbor across the alley, but the yard gave Stubby an idea, and he earned some dimes and one quarter in the next week. Most folks thought he was too little. One kind old lady told him he ought to be playing, not working. But there were people who would let him take out the big shears and cut grass around the flower beds and things like that. This he had to do afternoons when he was supposed to be off playing. And when he came home, his mother sometimes said, folks had it easy playing around all day. Now, it was the first week in July, and Stubby had a dollar and 20 cents. He was getting to the point where he'd wake in the night, find himself sitting up in bed, hands clenched. He had dreams about how folks would let him live if he had 99 cents, but how he only had 97 cents and a half, so they were gonna shoot him. But then, one day, he found Mr. Stewart. He was passing the house after having asked three people if they wanted a boy, and Stubby seemed so surprised when Mr. Stewart sang out, Say, boy, want a little job? It seemed at first it must be a joke. <laughs> or, 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 or a dream. Somebody asking him if he wanted a job, but the man was beckoning to him. So he pulled himself together and ran up the steps. Now, here's here now a little package here. 
You took something out of the mailbox. It don't belong here. It's to go to 302 Pleasant Street. You take it for a dime? Stubby nodded. As he was going down the steps, the man called, Say, boy, how's you like a steady job? For the first minute, it seemed pretty mean. Making fun of a fella that way. This'll be here every day. Suppose you come each day about this time, take it over there. Not mentioning it to anybody. Stubby felt weak. Why, well, <clears throat> all right, he managed to say. I give you 50 cents a week. That fair? Yes, sir, said Stubby, doing some quick calculation. Well, then, here goes for the first week, and handed him the other 40 cents. It was funny how fast the world could change. Stubby wanted to run. He hadn't been doing much running of late. He wanted to go home and get Hero to go with him to Pleasant Street, but didn't. No, sir. When you had a job, you had to tend to things. He was back in tune with life. He whistled, turned up his collar in the old rakish way. Back home, he jumped over the fence instead of going in the gate. Lately, he'd actually been using the gate. And he cried, Get out of my sight, you cur! In tones which, as Hero understood things, meant anything but getting out of his sight and really meant come over here and give me a hug, you little yellow bastard. He was a little boy again. He slept at night as a little boy's sleep. He... Played with Hero along the route, taught him some new tricks. His jaw was relaxed from its grown uppishness. It's funny about them, Stewarts. Sometimes he saw Mr. Stewart, but never anybody else. The place seemed closed up. But each day the little package was there. And every day, he took it to Pleasant Street and left it at the door there. But that place seemed closed up, too. Well, when it was well into the second week, Stubby ventured to say something about the 50 cents. The man fumbled in his pockets. Something in his face was familiar to the experienced young Stubby. It suggested having two dollars and a half by August 1st, but only having a dollar and a quarter state of mind. I haven't got the change, but I'll pay you the end of next week for the whole business. That all right? Stubby considered. I gots to have it before the first of August, he said. At that, the man laughed and muttered something, but he told Stubby, he would have it before the first. It bothered Stubby. He wished the man had given it to him then. He would rather get it each week and keep it himself. Little of the grown-up look stole back into his jaw. After that, he didn't see Mr. Stewart. And one day, a week or so later, the package was not in the box. And a man who wore the clothes, same kinds of clothes Stubby father wore, come along around the house and asked him what he was doing. Stubby was wary. Oh, uh, I got a little job I do for Mr. Stewart. The man laughed. Well, I had a little job I did for Mr. Stewart, too. You paid in advance? Stubby pricked up his ears. Cause if you ain't, I'd advise you go out and look for a little job somewhere else. Then it came out. Mr. Stewart was broke. More than that, 
he was off his nut. Lots of people were doing little jobs for Mr. Stewart, and there was no sense in any of them. And now he had suddenly been called out of town. There was a trembly feeling through Stubby's insides. But outwardly, he was bristling just like his hair. Where am I going to get what's coming to me? Afraid you won't get it, Sonny. We're all in the same boat. He looked up at Stubby up and down and then added, You're kind of little for that boat. But I got to have it, cried Stubby. I tell you, I got to. The man shook his head. That cuts no ice. Hard luck, Sonny. But we got to take our medicine in this world. Taint no medicine for kids, though, he muttered. Stubby's face just then was too much for the man, so he put his hand in his pocket, drew out a dime, saying, There now, young son, you run along and get you a soda. Forget your troubles. It ain't always like this. You'll have better luck next time. But Stubby, Stubby did not get the soda. He put the dime in his pocket and turned toward home. Something was the matter with his legs. They acted funny about carrying him. He tried to whistle, but something was the matter with his lips, too. Counting this dime, he now had a dollar and eighty cents. And it was the 28th day of July. Let's see, 30 days has September. April, June, and November, he was saying to himself. Then, all right, July was one of the long ones. That was a good thing. Been a great deal worse if July was a short one, like February. Again, he tried to whistle and managed to pipe out a few shrill little notes. When Hero came running up the hill to meet him, he slapped him on the back and cried, Hello, Hero! in tones fairly swaggering with bravado. That night, he engaged his father in conversation. The phrase is well adapted to the way Stubby went about it. <clears throat> How is it about, about things like taxes? Stubby crossed his knees and swung one foot to show his indifference. If you have almost enough, do they sometimes let you off? His father laughed scoffingly. Well, I guess not. I thought maybe, said Stubby, if a person had tried awful hard and had almost enough, something inside him was all shaky. So... He didn't go on. His father said that trying, well, trying didn't have nothing to do with it. Finally, Stubby resumed. It kind of seems if a person would have, if a person would have had enough, if they hadn't been beat out of it, if he had done the best he could, his father just snorted derisively and informed him that doing the best you could made no difference to the government. Hard luck stories didn't go when it came to the laws of the land. Thereupon, Stubby took a little walk out to the alley and spent a considerable time in contemplation of the neighbor's chicken yard. When he came back, he walked right up to his father and standing there, feet planted, shoulders squared, wanted to know in a desperate little voice, if someone else was to give, say, a dollar and eighty cents for Hero, could I take the other seventy out of my paper money? The man turned on him roughly. Oh, so that's it, is it? That's why you're getting so smart all of a sudden about the government. Well, look at here. 
just let me tell you something. If you're lucky enough to get to eat this winter, you know there's talking about the factory shutting down? Dog tax. Well, you're lucky if you get shoes. Stubby had turned away and was standing with his back to his father, hands in his pockets. And let me tell you something else, young man. If you got any dollar and 80 cents, you go on and give it to your mother. As Stubby was turning the corner of the house, his father added in, How'd you like me to get you an automobile? Would that, would that be better for your paper route? He went doggedly from house to house with the next afternoon. But nobody had any jobs. When Hero came running out to him that night, he patted him, but didn't speak. That evening, as they were sitting in the backyard, Stubby and Hero, a little apart from the others, his father was talking with his brother about anarchists. They were getting commoner, his father thought. There were a good many of them at the shop. They didn't call themselves that, but that's what they were. Well, uh, what is, what is an anarchist, anyhow? Stubby's mother wanted to know. Why, an anarchist, her lord informed her, is one that's against the government. He don't believe in the law and order. The real bad anarchists shoot them that tries to enforce the laws of the land. Guess you, if you'd read the paper these days, you'd know that sort of thing. Stubby's brain had been going round and round, and these words caught in it as it whirled. The government. The laws of the land. What? Well, well, it was the government and the laws of the land that was going to shoot Hero. It was the government, the laws of the land, that didn't care how hard you tried. Didn't care whether you'd been cheated. Didn't care about how you felt. Didn't care about nothing about, but getting the money. His brain got hotter. Well, he didn't believe in the government either. He was going to be one of them people. Them, them anarchists that were against the laws of the land. He'd done the very best he could, and now the government was going to take Hero away from him just because he couldn't get, couldn't get that other 70 cents. Stubby's mother didn't hear her son crying that night. But that was only because Stubby was successful in holding the pillow over his head. The next morning, he looked in one of the papers he was carrying to deliver to see what it said about anarchists. Sure enough, some place way off somewhere he never heard of, the anarchists had shot somebody that was trying to enforce the laws of the land. Well, that afternoon, Stubby tramped around looking for jobs. He saw a good many boys playing with dogs. None of them seemed to be worrying about whether their dogs had tags around their necks. To Stubby's hot little brain and sore little heart came the thought that, well, they didn't love their dogs any more than he loved Hero either. But the government didn't care whether he loved Hero or not. Pooh, what was that to the government? All it cared about was getting the money. He stood for a long time, watching a boy give his dog a bath. The dog was trying to get away, and the, the boy and another boy were having lots of fun about it. All of a sudden, Stubby turned and ran away, ran down an alley. Ran through a number of alleys, just kept on running, blinded by the tears. And that night, in the middle of the night, as something 
in his head going round and round, getting hotter and hotter. He decided the only thing for him to do was to shoot the policeman who came to take Hero away on the morning of August 1st. That would be day after tomorrow. All night long, policemen with revolvers stood around his bed. When his mother called him at half past four, he was shaking so much he could scarcely get in his clothes. On his way home from his route, Stubby had to pass a police station. He went on the other side of the street and stood there looking across. But one of them policemen was playing with a dog. Suddenly he wanted to rush over and throw himself down at that policeman's feet and just sob out the story, ask him to please, please, just wait till he could get that other 70 cents. But just then the policeman got up and went in the station. And Stubby was afraid to go in the police station. That policeman complicated things for Stubby. Before that, it had been quite simple. The policeman would come to enforce the law of the land, but he did not believe in the law of the land, so he would just kill the policeman. But it seemed the policeman wasn't just a person who enforced the laws of the land. He was also a person who played with a dog. After a whole day of walking around and thinking about it, his eyes burning, his heart pounding, he decided that the thing to do was to warn the policeman by writing a letter. He did not know whether real anarchists warned them or not, but Stubby couldn't get reconciled to the idea of killing a person without telling him you were going to do it. It seemed that even a policeman should be told, especially a policeman who played with a dog. The following letter was penciled by shaking hand late that afternoon. It was written upon a barrel in the Lynch woodshed on a piece of wrapping paper, a bristly little head bending over it. <laughs> to the policeman who comes to take my dog, cause I ain't got the 250. Cause I tried, but I could only get 180 cause a man was off his nut and didn't pay me what I earned. This is to tell you, I am an anarchist and do not believe in the government or the law and order and will shoot you when you come. I wouldn't have been an anarchist if I got the money and I tried to get it, but I couldn't get it. Not enough. I don't think the government had ought to take things that you like, like the way that I like Hero. So, I'm against the government. Thought I'd tell you first. Yours truly, F. Lynch. P.S. I don't see how I can shoot you because where would I get the revolver? So I have to do it with the butcher knife. Folks are sometimes killed that way because my father read it in the paper. If you wanted to take the 180 and leave Hero till I can get the 70, I will not do anything to you and would be very much obliged. One, one. 13 Willow Street. The letter was properly addressed and sealed. Not for nothing had Stubby's teacher given them instructions in the art of letter writing. 
A stamp he paid for out of the dime the man had given him to get a soda with and forget his troubles. Now, Bill O'Brien was on the desk at the police station and Miss Murphy of the Herald stood in with Bill. That was how it came about that the next morning a fat policeman, an eager looking girl, and a young fella with a Kodak descended into the holla to 1113 Willow Street. The boy peeped around the corner of the house. Such a wild looking little boy. Hair all standing up and eyes glittering. A yellow dog ran out and barked. The boy darted out and grabbed the dog in his arms, and in that moment, the girl called to the man with the black box. Right now, quick, get him, get him. They were getting ready to shoot Hero. That box, that box must have been the way the police did it. He must, go. he must, must. The boy and the, the, the dog together just sank to the ground, but just the same, the boy put himself in front and was shielding the dog. When Stubby had pulled himself together, the policeman was holding Hero. He said that Hero was certainly a fine dog. He had had a dog a good deal like him at home. And Miss Murphy, she was choking back sobs herself knew how he could earn the 70 cents that afternoon. Well, in this way does a good anarchist and a good story go down under the same blow. Because some of those sobs Miss Murphy had choked back had gotten into what she wrote about Stubby and his yellow dog. And the next day, citizens, with no sense of the dramatic people from all around the town, they sent money enough to register Hero for Life. At first, Stubby's father said he had had a good mind to lick him. But something in the quality of Miss Murphy's journalism left a hazy feeling of there being something remarkable about his son. He confided to his good wife that it wouldn't surprise him much if Stubby was someday president. Somebody had to be president, said he. And he had noticed it was generally those who in their youthful days did something that made lively reading in the newspapers. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Fireside Tales with Wolfgang. To view more of my work, check out my YouTube channel at Hunter's Acoustic Cabin. Directed by Hunter Ackerman. Endorsed by Wolfgang Beastly. Produced by GWC Productions. Originally broadcast on GWC Productions' YouTube channel, CAPS Media Television Channel 6, KPPQ LP Ventura at 104.1 FM, and on the KPPQ Podcast Network.